All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene at five minutes of 11 on uh, February 26th with the fourth evaluation criteria, that being economic development, and the presentation is from Commissioner Stebbins. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, colleagues. Uh, as I was standing up here, I noticed that there is a sign, and I'm just going to rib my colleague, Commissioner Cameron, for a minute because she didn't recognize the City of Boston fire code message that's up here. Oh. It says, prior to the start of each new session of 49 people or more, code requires that I notify the occupants of the emergency evacuation route. And it mentions a laminated sheet on the bottom of the lectern, which I can't remove because it's duct taped to the bottom of the lectern. But okay. I covered thank, it. Thank you for clarifying. Happy to help. My investigation wasn't complete. No, it wasn't. We'll move to the first slide. Economic development components. First of all, you will uh, you'll see as I go through my presentation that my preference is not to read PowerPoint slides back to each of you, but to offer my comments as we go through uh, the topics. The 34 questions in Section 3 of the application break out neatly into three criteria which measure the applicant's economic impact on the community and the region surrounding the facility. Coincidentally, these criteria are also provided in order of how they were laid out in the expanded gaming statutes findings and declarations section. Job creation covers headcount, job quality, rate of pay, benefits, workplace safety, recruitment efforts, labor relations, and strategies for recruiting unemployed and underemployed residents. Supporting external business growth focuses on how the applicant plans to support and contract with local vendors through the host surrounding community agreements purchasing dis domestically manufactured slot machines and efforts to engage minority women in veteran-owned businesses for the design, construction, and operation of the slots parlor. Regional tourism highlights how an applicant may help draw visitors to the region, partner with existing attractions, host additional events, and participate in, regional economic, in a regional economic development agenda. Massachusetts tourism industry generates close to a billion dollars in state and local tax revenue every year, 16.9 billion in travel related expenditures, and supports over 124,000 jobs in Massachusetts. Next slide. Our approach uh, I organized a group of uh, independent evaluators, technical experts who have significant, significant experience in the area of workforce development tourism and promotion of Massachusetts and regional economic development. I assigned a technical reviewer to be the primary reviewer for the criteria that corresponded with their area of expertise. Uh, Director Jill Griffin from the Mass Gaming Commission staff whose work at the Boston Foundation was focused on workforce issues and I reviewed e all three of the criteria questions. We had multiple group discussions on the applications and suggested possible ratings. Additionally, I used information from additional detail we, request, re, we requested on labor, payroll, and benefits through a request for clarification that went out to all applicants. I drew on information from our site visits in January. I drew on information from the 90-minute presentations from each of the applicants. I drew on information from follow-up questions we uh, placed in writing to the applicants and asked at the host community hearings. And I also utilized interview calls I made to organizations located throughout the area near our applicants' existing facilities. Also, studies provided under question 3.1 were also reviewed in the respective sections of the application. I also want to thank the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. They connected me with some people I would call key leaders in human resources policy who shared their thoughts and suggestions with me on key HR policies I should direct my attention to during the course of the review. Our goal was to review the slots parlor elements of each application first to ensure an apples to apples comparison. We would then take into consideration additional business strategies after this review was complete. Next slide. Our advisors and supports group uh, Support groups, here's a list of our staff and reviewers who assisted with the exhaustive evaluation of the RFA2 applications, comprising hundreds of pages for the 34 questions for the Category 2 slots parlor applicants. I want to tell you some detail about our external reviewers, as Commissioner Cameron did with her group, 
would also provide some background on our contractual subject matter experts, HLT. In addition to Jill, uh, we had Lynn Brown, former director of research for the Boston Federal Reserve Bank and the current lecturer in economics at Brandeis University, Jennifer James, the undersecretary of the Mass Department of Labor and Workforce Development, and Betsy Wall, the executive director of the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, and Jonathan Hyde, also from her office. HLT has also been a critical resource in this evaluation process, and I'm not just saying that because Lyle was seated to my right. This, uh, there was a strategic need to draw on the experience and financial projections from the team working with Commissioner Zuniga as well. Uh, Lyle is one of the founding principals at HLT, has been providing consulting services to uh, Canadian hospitality, leisure, and tourism industry for 30 years. Prior to coming to uh, HLT, he was the national director of KPMG Canada Hospitality, Leisure, and Tourism Practice based in Toronto. We also had helping us from HLT, Carla Giancola, uh, who's been responsible for pulling together a lot of this information as well as had consulting, worked on consulting projects in tourism in gaming sectors, including horse racing, for both public and private sector clients. We move on to uh, overall observations. Excellent. These are the overall observations that the uh, independent evaluators professional consultants, MGC staff, and myself discovered from our review of these three applications. First, goes without saying, uh, and it's been mentioned before, that each applicant has the experience and track record to run a successful slots facility. Uh, the MGC encouraged competition from the start, and we certainly got it with these three great choices. Category two license applications proposed projects within the guidelines of the statute, the 1,250 slots minimum, minimum investment of 125 million. These facilities are expected to draw from their immediate vicinity. There was no expectation to help draw patrons internationally, but they did demonstrate awareness of other area amenities and how they may be able to leverage visitors already coming to the area. Tourism industry benefits were less pronounced than what we will expect in Category 1 applications. Questions relative to international tourism were optional for the Category 2 applicants and though there was some effort undertaken to make possible linkages, uh, we didn't feel that there was sufficiently strong enough information to warrant rating the question and taking these questions into account in our evaluation. <coughs> With respect to job creation and local operational spending, applicants identified partnerships they hoped to pursue and were able to describe outreach efforts for connecting with local small business. From additional review of their websites, each applicant showed relationships with businesses both large and small operating in the immediate area of their other facility. There was acknowledgement in the applications that competition was expected from Category 1 casinos by year 2 or 3 of the slots parlor license and adjustments were noted about employment levels in what we'll call stabilized years. There was considerable evidence that applicants in various degrees had made a strong commitment to understanding the area around their proposed facilities key partners and organizations helpful to their overall success. Uh, they have numerous goals to meet as part of their license, and we wanted to, we were assessing their ability to quote unquote hit the ground running upon award of a license. Here's my approach to this presentation this morning in reviewing the three criteria categories in question three, section three. We're going to acknowledge that tourism impact was determined to be less significant than what we expect from Category 1 applicants. I decided to start with that category and work our way backward to the number one section, jobs. When we consider the public debate that transpired during the host community referendums, jobs was the most critical component. We decided to focus most of our attention and discussion on that criteria. Secondly, we will review external Category 2 slots parlor applications from the vantage point of impact on external business. From day one, the Commission has stressed the need for these gaming licensees to have an impact on surrounding businesses that should be viewed only in a positive light. And finally, we will address jobs, employment, HR policies, benefits, and other workplace issues as it relates to the job creation criteria. I feel there is some difference between the applicants in this category. Tourism components. We grouped questions under regional tourism and attractions. We focused on what applicants could provide 
what applicants could provide the most detailed strategy for promoting the region and acknowledging other attractions and amenities in the region. We also, also wish to see what experience the applicants had from operating other facilities and gave strong consideration to independent acknowledgement of success as demonstrated through letters of recommendation and from other jurisdictions. As, in, as I mentioned, we uh, decided the international marketing question was optional and would not require a rating. And finally, we looked at amenities, community enhancements, and other events and activities designed to draw more patrons into the host community and the surrounding area. Tourism discussion. What we were looking for and what we found and what we didn't find. What we were looking for were marketing initiatives, collaboration with the tourism organizations and attractions, and demonstrated knowledge of the host community and region. We were looking for applicants sharing their related experience from other facilities and how that would translate into a successful strategy in Massachusetts. What we found, we did find experience with plans for a range of traditional marketing partnership advertising and reward, i.e. player card programs. Uh, we, find, didn't, we did find or didn't find some limited detail and connections to existing Massachusetts marketing infrastructure, the Massachusetts Office of Tourism, as I mentioned, attractions, infrastructure, and other market segments. Uh, the approach taken by the applicants in tourism and marketing uh, reflects the considerable pent-up demand for gaming in Massachusetts and the monopoly afforded to a Category 2 license for the initial few years of operation. Uh, there was discussion about connecting with local Massachusetts sports teams, but awareness could have used more detail about operating models, i.e. assumptions on ticket availability and sponsorships. All applicants provided uh, limited detail in demonstrating a connection to the Massachusetts marketing infrastructure, again, the Mass Office of Tourism, attractions, infrastructure, and other market segments. Uh, Penn does reference, uh, or uh, Plainville does reference working with Mott but no applicant provided really a detailed approach. Uh, this was interesting because one of the questions actually provided a hyperlink to Mott's website directly from the application. Our tourism ratings. Again, all applicants referenced experience with marketing programs and utilizing their player database. They also referenced using their rewards programs to highlight other area attractions and amenities. Uh, Lemonster uh, focused on MOUs with some local partners, past experience with marketing programs, loyalty cards, providing cross-marketing plans. They broadly identified plans to work with local tourism uh, in chamber, uh, chambers of commerce. They identified linkage with regional and uh, regional economic development plan and provided endorsement from other cities in which they operate. Uh, Lemonster also demonstrated a history of revitalization of downtown cores for tourists and local benefits. They also have a history of significant financial support for community organizations and events and detailed a proposed entertainment facility and reference experience with entertainment offerings. Plainville provided MOUs for local partners, significant past experience with marketing loyalty programs, detailed a cross-marketing plan in their stay, play, and shop uh, awareness program for other area attractions. They detailed some plans to work with Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, past experience shown working with other local convention and visitors bureau. Uh, racing also coincides with Penn's experience operating other racetracks in other North American jurisdictions. They have extensive marketing capability, player database, and skill sets from other Penn venues provided detail on some of their marketing approaches. Endorsement letters from chambers and other organizations were provided from other jurisdictions. Provided letters and commitments regarding other community enhancements and again, extensive past experience from their other facilities. Again, a number of letters coming from communities in which they already operate. Uh, Rainham, uh, no MOUs that we could find in place for local agreements and detailed descriptions on plans for cross-marketing. There was some limited mention of local tourism bodies, convention, visitors, bureaus, and attractions, um, and other marketing initiatives aside from referencing plans to emulate approach taken by their facility in Pennsylvania. They did have a stronger focus on sports partnerships throughout the region and potential, obviously, for supporting harness racing operation in the future. Support for external business components. 
this is where we also grouped uh, question 3.3 because it asks about coordination with regional economic development plans. We folded it in into this discussion. We group questions around local business promotion. Uh, supporting and benefiting area businesses is a priority recognized in the statute and positions the slots parlor applicant to impact the regional economy. Commissioner, yep. could I interrupt you? I'm sorry, I had a sure, question in mind that I, I forgot. Um, if you go back on the, uh, the, the tourism ratings, um, one of the, uh, and maybe you're going to get this. If you are, tell me and I'll shut up. But one of the uh, long suits in the application of Plainville was this uh, affiliation with the other major big attractions in the area, the TPC, Gillette, the mall. Right. Were there agreements, were there signed agreements with any of those big attractions? Uh, if I recall the package, there were MOUs. Uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me being the guy from Western Mass is what a draw the Rentham Outlet Village is. Uh, and there was a, I you know that have, was one example of an MOU. in Western Mass? We do have walls and uh, malls in Western Mass. Um, but uh, what was interesting uh, about Rentham is the number of people who journey from Boston down to Rentham that come in on the, the cruise ships. Betsy Wall from Mott told us they organize bus charters to take international visitors down to the Rentham Outlet Village. So I know Rentham was one example of an MOU that, uh, that I believe Plainville had a signed agreement with. They did uh, have a signed agreement with. I believe so. Mark so a public marketing agreement, a marketing relationship. With, with Rentham? Yes. Yep. And the others? Gillette and um, I can't recall. GPC. I'd have to go back and look I at I the I believe they did. No. Gordon, can you but let's just leave this an open question because we'll I'll come back. We'll yeah. come back. If you could find out the other big, the other big attractions. I, I, I think it was important to note that uh, they recognized. Uh, I think it was pretty clear. I think everybody recognized uh, Foxborough Patriots Place. Uh, I, I think where Plainville probably somewhat exceeded was identifying TPC. Uh, it was another entertainment. Venue, which Comcast. name escapes me at the, Com the Comcast. time. Comcast. Comcast. Comcast Center, thank you. Uh, as well as the Rentham Outlet Village, which again I think was a, a somewhat unique approach to demonstrating that relationship and how important it is to, how right. important the mall is to the region. Yeah, that's just the point. That I, I, it's interesting the, the extent to which those assertions of relationships are actually translated into agreements. Uh, that's what I'm interested in right. for those four we'll come back facilities. Back. Okay, Commissioner. Um, our, our, our transcriber, you, you're okay with the speed, Lori? I, I can't hear oh, Okay. Sorry, I, I just, just on the microphone and then the speed, Commissioner. Sorry, I just responded to the chair and said we would come back tomorrow with a, a list of which agreements are available. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jump back. Okay. Uh, Again, support for external businesses and job growth is somewhat contradictory perception that gaming facilities only want pensioners to visit and stay within the confines of their property. But uh, we had repeated reference to contracting business uh, businesses with minority, veteran, and women-owned businesses throughout all phases of the project was a key feature of this game, of the gaming statute. The uh, requirement to demonstrate. Uh, uh, plans for compliance with ANF Administrative Bulletin Number 14 for any licensee in the construction process was also addressed in this section. All three applicants satisfactorily answered the question about uh, plans to buy domestically manufactured gaming equipment, and they all provided a list of their likely vendors. Uh, what we were looking for, uh, past experience, again, uh, important and plans detailing impacts of cross-marketing initiatives, extent of relationships with local suppliers and vendors, and arrangements in place with local and WB, MB, and VB vendors. Also, a realistic achievable experience-based projections including quantification of local spending and vendor arrangements, number of arrangements, and the types of partnerships. All applicants recognize this significant uh, direct uh, and indirect economic benefits a gaming f facility could have on the host community's surrounding area. In general, all applicants demonstrated the positive impact from their existing operations. 
all focused on their commitment to local spending through provisions in their host and surrounding community agreements. Uh, where we found some information lacking was detail about how these strategic partnerships would materialize in Massachusetts. Uh, we wanted to balance both an applicant's focus on best efforts with need for substantive detail. Uh, there was some expression of a 30,000 foot view of how a collaborative uh, strategy with small business would work, uh, but needed more detail to show that they were learning the local area and who their potential partners could be. Sitting here uh, yesterday, I was uh, mildly jealous of all the wonderful slides that Commissioner McHugh was able to present. Uh, I've included one of my own. It's pretty attractive. <laughs> <laughs> this is our version of a redacted slide. Um, but to give you a sense of the spending categories we consider, this redacted chart categorizes main areas on the left-hand column. Overall expenditures in year one for uh, Leminster and Plainville ranged from 21 million to 37 million. Uh, Raymondum provided to us an estimated operating cost for a stabilized year of 43 million. It's worth noting that uh, I believe Plainville's estimates also included about 7 million in spending attributed to horse racing. Uh, and Raynham's operating costs reflect significant entertainment and market spend, marketing spending in years three through five. Uh, as we've discussed, operating expenditures are a function of revenue, and if financial projections are estimated to be too high, then the issue, that would reduce operating expenditures proportionally. Here are support for external business ratings. Uh, with respect to Lemonster, they'll follow strategies that they've used with the uh, connection with their operation of Maryland Live, respect to relationships with local businesses, outreach programs, cross-marketing, loyalty cards. Uh, it was intrigued by using potential local restaurant operators as third-party operators for food and beverage in their casino. Past experience, uh, again, a Maryland Live was detailed. They provided some MOUs uh, with local chambers and other organizations, committed, as all the parties were, to following their host community agreement with respect to uh, identifying appropriate union labor, uh, detailed plans to work with local business vendors in construction and operations. Uh, their past history was provided with some of those ratios. Offered detailed means of assisting businesses in terms of bid splitting, <coughs> excuse me, quotation lead times, bid assistance, uh, detailed their plans to work with the MBE, WBE, and VBE business vendors uh, their diversity plan and past experience was also detailed. They also acknowledged uh, that they plan to beat some of the required guidelines for MBE and DBE participation as uh, mentioned previously in that administrative bulletin. Uh, the applicant at this stage also referred to their support for M3D3 uh, that routinely came up in their presentations. Uh, we reviewed uh, PPEs uh, Lemonster's participation and stakeholder involvement in the project. Uh, job creation numbers for this program are somewhat speculative, but uh, we did give them credit for uh, what we'd call thinking outside the box, how they could strengthen the overall region of the state. If they are awarded a license, I would uh, suggest that making a commitment to MD3, M3D3 would be a special condition of the license. Here again, also, uh, and this is a term that we've also heard uh, repeatedly in some of the presentations, the gateway city status was mentioned here. Uh, this status is, an, is through an initiative through the executive branch. Gateway cities must reach the following criteria, prop population greater than 35,000 uh, and less than 250,000, a median household income below the state average, and the rate of educational attainment of a bachelor's degree uh, or above that is below the state average. Uh, the designation highlights really an economic condition of older industrial cities and directs other programmatic money to these cities uh, through other branches of the executive, uh, of the executive branch. Plainville, uh, detailed plans to work with local business, again, focusing on their place, stay, and shop packages and relationships. Detailed plans to work with local suppliers, outreach fairs, meetings, expo, already had conducted some of these types of events at Plain Ridge. Their past experience was detailed in letters of endorsement from other communities. 
Uh, they did provide some detailed plans to MBE, WB, and VBE business vendors, and a diversity plan was provided. They have extensive past experience, most recently from Ohio, which was highlighted in this section of the application. Rainham also plans to use local businesses as vendors and service providers. They included endorsement letters from uh, some key organizations uh, adjacent to their facility in Pennsylvania. Uh, they obviously also have commitments in their host community and surrounding community agreements for hiring locally, uh, using local firms and vendors, uh, primarily in the host and surrounding communities. Plan to work, uh, they did offer some plans to work with local suppliers, businesses, and advertising and vendor fairs, similar strategies. Uh, uh, that the other two applicants highlighted. Uh, their plans to assist business through outreach and membership in local organizations and funding some of those local organizations was highlighted. They detailed plans also for MBEWBE and VBE business vendor participation. Uh, strong projections for benefit to the regional business and economy due to projected higher revenues. Uh, through all that and through some of their plans, uh, what was lacking was uh, that we could find was specific community partners that they were planning to, to work with for outreach. Only one community partner was identified. Could, could I? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You want to go, you want to go back? No, no. I, I, this, this is where I wanted to ask the question. I'll okay. finish with this. Yeah. You're not allowed to ask questions. Oh. <laughs> he doesn't like to be interrupted. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I don't like to be interrupted. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, job creation components. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're, go ahead. I, I thought you were staying still on this other one. No. Nope. Um, criteria number 16 in the legislation is the one that talks about um, uh, commitments to uh, diverse suppliers and so forth, and uh, it calls for specific goals. And are there specific goals? And could you just give us a flavor of, of what they are? Are they and are they pretty much the same? I, I would say there are specific goals when it comes to uh, involvement of minority women, I believe, in veterans in the construction process, and that's through the A and F Administrative Bulletin 14. Yeah. Uh, most of the applicants said we can meet that, we have plans to meet that, or even <coughs> attempt to exceed that, and they demonstrated uh, from their track record where they've been able to do that. I think where there was some disconnect is how they plan to meet those objectives here in Massachusetts. Uh, there in, really in was operations or in construction or both. Just as it uh, as it relates to Administrative Bulletin 14, okay, which is a component of the construction. Yeah. Um, there wasn't. Uh, I don't believe, and we can go back and check, but I don't believe that they, any of them set guidelines uh, for vending. Uh, with minority women or veteran-owned businesses. I don't think any of them actually set targets. I think they all express good faith efforts. Right. Uh, and where we looked behind that was to uh, the level of detail in their strategies to be successful. Because I, I think this criteria calls for, it says identify specific goals. Um, and I think this is an area that, that we have chosen to interpret very aggressively and to make it an important criteria. And if it if there aren't, and I've seen this in other in, my, in our own review in the operations area, it's a lot fuzzier than in the in the construction area, and it's not perfect in the construction area. So I think this would be an area that, if they're the same, then it doesn't make much difference in terms of right. the, their uh, the ratings. But as we make a selection, I don't think it's good enough to just have warm and fuzzy. Um, you know, uh, promises. Um, I think we need more than that, and there's, we ought to figure out a way to condition that. We need something that Director Griffin can watch and say, you know, are you doing what you said you would do or not? This is Correct. clearly something that the legislature wanted to make a high priority, and we do too. But we're happy to go back and look at that question and then go back and review. <clears throat> That'd the be I'd, I'd be interested, in, um, Lyle, if you would give us the particulars, such particulars as there are on those two categories. We will do that, yes. All right. I, I actually did have a question here, if you'll, if you'll Sure. Me. Yeah. Uh, and it, it has to do with the, with the uh, uh, short narrative you have with the MD3, MD, M3D3 proposal. Mm -hmm. is it, was there any measurement, or is it possible to make a measurement of the anticipated 
uh, yield from what might be viewed as seed money here or a partial support for an industry, i.e., is there any way to figure out uh, or, or, or were we, did we figure out uh, likely yields from the $1 million a year investment? Um, uh, it seems to me that in some cases uh, a commitment to in, invest X number of dollars in an industry or X number of dollars in a, a local industry of some kind would provide a floor for businesses to start and, um, uh, and job creation that went beyond the, the direct investment. Is there any, any way to measure that? You know, what, what we looked at, what we examined, and uh, we also took the opportunity to talk to uh, other folks in state government who have helped provide seed money to the UMass Lowell M2D2 program, which mm -hmm. is kind of the, uh, uh, I think, a more preliminary stage assistance program uh, through UMass Lowell. Um, I think what we looked at was what their level of commitment was, what role the applicant was going to play. Are they truly a stakeholder in the process as opposed to just handing over a check every year? Uh, I think most of the information that we found that was available, uh, is, as I alluded to earlier, was somewhat speculative in what they thought the end result would be. Uh, they obviously, uh, again, I, I thought it was somewhat of a, a creative approach in their application. They, it certainly demonstrated an awareness of the region and the economy around them. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were basing it off of, again, it's a brand new program. I don't think there's a, a significant track record they, they were following and projecting a certain increase in jobs. But we can also go back and, and take a look. Well, at I was that. thinking but that there's no need to do it with respect to that. I was thinking more generically that, that um, if, uh, uh, the thought being, if, if you could show uh, a level of investment of X, uh, then uh, uh, entrepreneurs could raise uh, a certain amount of money and have a, a net of X plus Y, but the Y would be impossible unless they had the X. And, and I don't know how you, whether you can measure that or, or, or how you do it or whether you have to do it on a specific business I can, I can by business. Actually, I can actually speak to that a little bit uh, because we looked at this in my area. I'll talk about this, but one of the reviewers on our team was uh, the guy who's in charge of Mass Challenge, which is a dramatic um, and uh, um, startup funding uh, incubator comparable kind of an organization that gives challenge awards to to startup companies. And so he, he was able to speak quite articulately to it. So two things on that. One is we talked with the people from Cordish and said, would you be um, flexible and amenable to how this program works? Because we think we could bring expertise to the table in making sure that it's not just a check, that there's other resources brought to bear, and how the, uh, the contests are run and what the size of the awards and so forth. And they were, they were ecstatic to the idea that they might get help on that, were receptive to it, one, and two, um, for what it's worth, uh, John Harthorne, for, who's the CEO of Mass Challenge, you, you simply can't predict with any degree of certainty, you know, what you would get out of this. But the uh, having a hundred thousand, their idea is ten grants of a hundred thousand each each year at least. Um, having a hundred thousand from an organization like this does give you credibility with other angel investors, other early early stage investors, <coughs> makes it much more likely you'll be able to get early stage money. And if you do 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 of these over a course of a few years, you're going to hit one or two. You know, and it could, you know, if, if one of them turns into be Meditech, you know, then you've generated 25,000 jobs. So it, it, there's, there's simply no way you can predict a real number, but you can predict with some degree of certainty that over a period of time it will, it will produce something real and material. Does the same, of, and, and, and I'm interrupting you. For, no. for, uh, I'll save this for, okay. for, for, uh, for uh, Steve's uh, okay. presentation, because I have some other questions along that line, but okay. I don't want to interrupt further. I now want to um, ask a couple of questions, if I may. Sure. Um, so um, as, as per the description, uh, there's a lot of um, goals as well on, on uh, organized labor at the 
in, in the statute. Is, is, is this the section where we're evaluating? No, it's, it's um, going uh, to fall into where the break in the, the series of questions are. It's, it's, it's jobs. kind of in interesting, the jobs? but it falls into jobs okay. because they talk about labor as part of the workforce, but the questions extend into uh, you know, PLA, labor harmony, and things okay. like that. The, we we can get to that. I had a second question that I believe is, is here. Um, which you mentioned relative to um, uh, racing. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the case of uh, Plainville, uh, they maintain racing. You mentioned um, $7 million or so of spend to maintain those, those operations. Right. Um, did we compare that? Well, first of all, um, Raynham also has a commitment on, on racing, even though it's a partial Correct. commitment. We what? focused on that. I believe that showed up in their part of the application under the tourism piece. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Job creation components. Uh, this <laughs> Next slide. Oops. Uh -oh. Wake up. <laughs> job creation components. This criteria calls for the commission to review job counts. Quality of jobs is evidenced through salaries and benefits, hiring strategies, and overall HR policy and practices. Uh, in addition, we examine how an applicant plan to hire local residents and methods for training employees and meet the statute's requirement to provide new employment opportunities for the unemployed and underemployed, and how do you reach those target populations. Employee retention and strategies for improving retention were a critical piece. Expectations are that new employees may resign their positions in the short term as they become acquainted with the requirements of employment and specific duties. And finally, we wanted to look to an applicant's overall goal of allowing for unionization, their past track record, and efforts to ensure labor harmony. What we were looking for, again, we were looking for applicants to give us a detailed and realistic plan for hiring employment levels, benefits, and to provide projected employment when the resort destination casinos came online. Uh, applicants provided to varying degrees of information on existing operations, based on exi existing operations in other jurisdictions. Applicants demonstrated an awareness of the staffing requirements for the proposed facility. This we would find under the, what we found, didn't find. Uh, <coughs> for their proposed facilities, but for the most, most part we felt fell short in describing how staff would be identified, trained, and retained, notably the underemployed and unemployed. Applicants were certainly sensitive to affirmative action requirements, and the workforce development plans had limited detail providing little focus on career path advancement opportunities and pre-employment programs. I think we went by one. There we go, another one of my lovely slides. Uh, before I discuss what I can in this slide, I should mention that we went back to each applicant and asked for additional uh, detail with respect to their application. We asked for a more detailed breakdown of full-time and part-time positions, FTEs, salaries, benefits, and unionization. We also asked the, for these numbers to be projected by the applicants in the first year of operation and for a subsequent year when competition was introduced in Massachusetts. Uh, it was their so-called stabilized year uh, or maximum competition year. Uh, Leminster had the most consistent numbers from year one to the stabilized year. Plainville rejected, uh, reflected, I'm sorry, a decrease in overall uh, FTEs from year one to the stabilized year showing the impact from full competition. Raynham's FTE counts reflected an increase in non-gaming FTEs between year one and the stabilized year based on projected increase in non-gaming and entertainment offerings. Okay, now we can go back to the rating page. Again, I, I wanna echo here before we start talking about uh, the ratings is, is we had the opportunity, I had the opportunity with my colleagues to do the site visits to their facilities in other states. Uh, I was impressed um, with the level of uh, attention that they give to their employees, the level of services they give to their employees. Are you talking about all of them? I, I am talking about all of them. Uh, 
just an observation from the site visit. Uh, uh, what impressed me were the accommodations and facilities that they make available to their employees kind of behind the screen. Uh, a, a, a very good example was uh, Parks. Their employee cafeteria behind the scenes really could have stood up to any of their fine dining facilities that they had out on the gaming floor. So uh, I give certainly credit and make that note about all three of the applicants. Notes on Lemonster. Again, I mentioned they have the most stable payroll FTE count over the five-year period and tied to revenue. They have detail, they did detail for us past experience with retention training and benefits. They had an MOU that they highlighted with the arc of opportunity to offer job opportunities for the disabled who are often underemployed or have higher rates of unemployment. They referenced working with the Mass Community, uh, Community College Casino Career Training Institute as well as an agreement with Fitchburg State for student internships. This mirrors their success working with Anne Arundel Community College to facilitate uh, job access, workforce development. They focused also on job fairs, employment center. Detailed job descriptions uh, were somewhat lacking detail regarding their training programs and development and career paths. They did mention uh, their intention to work with the unions. They had, uh, I believe, one uh, union endorsement letter that was included as part of their application. Uh, they had somewhat detailed employee retention strategies. They also shared with us what their past turnover rates were. Uh, they will use their diversity plan, will use a diversity plan created uh, especially for this proposed uh, facility. There's a commitment to diversity affirmative action and it's detailed from their past experience again. They also uh, agreed as one of the questions posed to them at the host community hearings to verbally agree to negotiate employment levels as a condition of their license. Plainville holds the lowest payroll and average uh, payroll and FTE count, uh, but we discussed that that might be more, reali more realistic and can better withstand increased competition. They have a higher union representation which demonstrates uh, what we would suggest are longer term obligations. More dedicated to medical and dental benefits for full time staff than the other two applicants. Focusing on recruiting 90% of their employees from the host and surrounding communities. Provided past experience specifically targeting the under, unemployed and underemployed populations. Provided a workforce development plan, again, job fairs, advertising, internal training. Commitment to diversity, affirmative action was clearly laid out in their application. Uh, their HR plans could use a little more detail regarding training programs, uh, developing career pathways, uh, but their past experience shows uh, some monetary contribution to those uh, specific areas within HR. Strong union labor representation agreement is in place and strong history of union labor. Uh, they have also notified us that uh, they have signed a project labor agreement with the building trades. Uh, they shared with us, uh, this it came up again at, uh, at one of the host community hearings, uh, what I thought were uh, creative strategies for reducing retention, or uh, increasing retention, sorry. Uh, and, but their current turnover rate was slightly higher than the other two applicants. Also, they committed in writing to maintaining employment levels also as a condition of their license. Uh, Raynham. Aggressive revenue projections and the highest overall employee count and payroll. Their plan is uh, for 80% of the local hires through their host community and surrounding community agreements. They also mentioned efforts to work with the Mass Community College Casino Career Training Institute and other local community colleges for training assistance. There was limited detail on targeting underemployed and unemployed populations beyond their plans to go back and try to recruit uh, some former Raynham Park employees who may still be unemployed. Commitment again in the host community agreement uh, for training and development and reference experience again at their facility in Pennsylvania. Uh, we could not find uh, details on an affirmative action plan or other referencing copying uh, Park's facility in Pennsylvania. Stated intentions to use union labor though no formal agreements uh, beyond a letter of support from a local union was provided. Uh, financial projections indicate the lowest percentage of union payroll and percentage of union jobs as a total of their FTE count. 
provided a retention ratio which is strong. Employ plans for employee retention were highlighted at the host community hearing. Uh, we could not find any diversity plans uh, provided for in the application, but they do reference minority employment breakdown at their uh, facility in Pennsylvania. Again, they would also provide for horse racing employment should they be selected. Could I ask one uh, question here? Yes. Again, at the risk. Um, the, on, the, on the blackout slide, um, when it's unblacked out, there are numbers for um, for pay, there are payroll numbers, and then uh, there are numbers for benefits. Okay. Uh, are the benefits included in the in the uh, payroll numbers, or are they in addition to the payroll numbers? Are they in addition to the payroll number, whatever that is? In, in the unredacted material that you have, you have you have the straight payroll number and the payroll number plus benefits, and the benefits shown separately. So all all three. Right. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, I'll look again then. Thank you. Question. Go ahead. Um, the slide before the blackout, the last slide we spoke about before we went back to the blackout slide, which was um, the job creation rating. Mm -hmm. um, I know you, at, at the bottom, the last bullet, you talk about the M3D3, and then you have maintaining racing employment. It's not mentioned at uh, at Raynham at all, I suspect that's because there's, there are no plans or numbers or, is that, is that accurate? Um, you know, th th there's a partial commitment for racing, but yet not a detailed plan, is that? Again, I didn't, I didn't, uh, as, as, as I mentioned at the start, some of my notes don't always reflect what you're gonna see on the slide, but we did, uh, we did mention that Raynham would also provide horse racing employment should they be selected, but I don't think we have a concrete number as to what that horse racing employment would be. I know there was a memo that I read regarding this, um, regarding actually comparing the uh, off-site amenities or the additional, um, uh, the What we're calling additional business strategies. For yes, lack of a better term. did you have a chance to analyze those three um, aspects of of the application or of the um, of the evaluation. I'm not sure I'm clear about your question. Um, for example, you know, jobs. Oh, or, looking at jobs connected with racing and connected with the M3D3. Correct. Again, our intention from the start was to analyze each as apples to apples slots parlor evaluation. Uh, there's obviously in, in employment related to both the existing paramutual facility at, at, uh, um, at Raynham. There's existing jobs that we know are available at, uh, at Plainville. We also have the potential for jobs being created through uh, Lemonster's proposal to make a contribution to uh, 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 the M3D3 program. But I think where we wound up with the information that we got back was strictly on Slots parlor, apple, slots parlor operation and what those jobs were and how they broke out. So we're still kind of keeping those factors separately until we've gone through okay. the so analysis. You'll, you'll, you'll talk about that later or maybe I could have Rob speak about that because I do think it's an important piece here. Uh, I do, I, I think it's an important piece as well. Um, again, my, my hope in going through the uh, my goal in going through this section of the application was to, again, compare everybody mm -hmm. apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Maybe we do have information available we can certainly look at, but I left that to the side is, you know, we plan to deliberate after all the presentations are through and figure out, I think, collectively where we feel that needs to uh, be part of the discussion, how to weigh in, in, weigh in with it. Okay, I just didn't know any new information would be delivered tomorrow, and that's, new information, I would think, or so maybe maybe I can ask Rob to, to talk about that later. I'll, I, I don't want to interrupt. Please finish. Can, can, can I just maybe clarify then? Sure. Uh, so the previous slide, the one that's blacked out, the number under um, in, any one of them, but let's just say Plainville and Raynham for that matter, those numbers do not include 
um, racing related jobs? The Plainville numbers do, re do include racing related jobs in non gaming. And what? In non gaming? In non gaming. In non Say, wait, wait a second. Say that again. What? Plainville includes the, the the number the the individuals who are working in the paramutual operation, the horse racing operation, yeah. will be included in this chart in non gaming to keep the comparison of the the gaming floors more similar between the three applicants. Okay, I'm sorry. So yeah, so they are included in the 575 number. Yes, they are included, but they're included in the non gaming. Yeah. Line. Okay, I got it. All right. In the yeah. I'm sorry, my, my apology for that misstate. And the RAINAM number does not include jobs associated with the facility, the projected facility in Brockton? It does not. No. It does not, okay. What about um, M3, D3 projected or? There's no. That's, no. that's not included in the Levenster numbers. And I take it that lack of inclusion <laughs> stems from uh, the lack of any information in the application that would uh, allow one to to conclude how many jobs are involved, right? Th th there was no information provided by Lemonster with respect to M3D3 payroll numbers, and these payroll numbers are at the site. Right, and there was no information provided by Raynham for the jobs uh, uh, if they uh, get into the uh, racing business. Is that right? There was not because that was subject to a couple of conditions, not right. the least of which right. is that racing right. ceased at Plain Ridge. No, I just I just wanted to clarify uh, why there's numbers for one and not for the other two. Right. The bottom line is we weren't provided with those any numbers. Correct. All right. So if the delta between 671 and 575 is greater because one includes racing and the other one doesn't include the, non gaming, the, let's say. The delta on the gaming side is very similar. The delta on the non gaming side is greater. Right. In other words, the, the, the gaming floors are reasonably similar. And the reason we put the bracing numbers in, in non gaming is because uh, each of the applicants have different non gaming activities they're doing in their, in their proposals. Uh, oh, there would be more, let's say, uh, food and beverage food, exactly. over at uh, Leminster, for Lemonster. example. Excuse me, um, and yep. I gather you found those numbers credible, basically. I mean, you didn't, you're, you're not discounting any of those numbers particularly. Uh, discounting their accuracy? Yeah. Uh, again, this was information that was provided to us by the applicants. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, we asked for first full year of operations and then what we somewhat allowed them to give us numbers for full competition or maximum competition. Uh, and it goes back to Lemonster was relatively consistent uh, between their first year and uh, uh, the stabilized year. Plainville reflected a decrease brought on by the increased competition. Uh, and Raynham saw a reflection of growth uh, in, in jobs between their first year and their stabilized year. And most of that was in non-gaming and part-time employment, is that right? That, that's correct, and I think we, we're limited here to what was in the public aspects of the, of the uh, applications, which were the first year numbers. Uh, the, the question you asked about are these numbers deemed credible, the first year numbers are more reasonable, the third year numbers, as Councilor, or Commissioner Sevens has mentioned, we think are somewhat aggressive in random with respect to some of the non-gaming elements they're proposing. Right. And what, and what, would the, what were the non gaming elements generically, do you remember? Uh, primarily entertainment and food and beverage. Yes, okay. The, the multi-purpose yeah. area that. Okay, has. okay. Uh, just to wrap up, again, uh, it certainly bears again repeating. Sorry, uh, sorry go I, I've got one more. I That's okay. Too. Okay, um, so go back to the summary of jobs. The, uh, the, cat, the rank rating, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the difference, the significant difference, if I'm remembering this right, between Lemonster and Plainville was that Lemonster has about 20% more jobs, which 
I think you said is, you know, was the sine qua non sort of of your criteria. Why, is, was there something that off, you, you would think that would give the Lemonster site an advantage. Um, was there something that offset that? Or w was there something that Plain, did, Plainville did that was equally dramatically better that, new, that leveled that out? Or, you know, with that big a difference in jobs, I, I wonder how you came to this conclusion. I, we, came to, we came to the conclusion again. I, my feeling is that, uh, as we discussed, Plainville had most realistic in payroll and labor estimates between year one and stabilized year, a year of maximum competition. Uh, I, I think that certainly it was probably a more conservative approach. Uh, it may just be an approach, you know, brought, in, brought on by their experience operating other facilities. I think with Lemonster, uh, we saw the stable payroll and FTE employee accounts between, you know, year one and, uh, and the maximum competition year. Um, I guess that posed a question for us as to, again, how realistic those numbers were to maintain the employment. I think, you know, even when we went out to the host and surrounding community hearings, we asked the applicants, how do you plan to deal with, a, you know, a, a projected uh, uh, reduction in jobs when category one competition comes into play? And each of them laid out the strategies for us. So that, to me, that's somewhat conflicted with kind of a numbers that didn't show a dramatic fall off. Okay. I thought Lyle was saying that he had, they had a problem with, and you mentioned you had a problem with the rain of numbers. I didn't hear you say you had a problem with the Lemonster numbers as well. I, I think despite the fact that Lemonster is just 20 percent in that order of magnitude, I think in, from, a <clears throat> from an operating point of view, that's not that far apart when rubber meets the road and they're actually in there running the operations. The rain of numbers were considerably higher than that in the uh, in follow-on years, and we were concerned just that the gap there was too large. Okay. C could an offsetting, uh, I, I was actually going to have the, the, the opposite question, um, uh, not on jobs, but on the on labor agreements. Um, the, um, I, I suspect since this, when, when these went to print, um, we received recently a letter of a signed agreement with the construction trades in right. the case of Plainville. You did mention it in I your remarks. That. Yep. Um, but that would make one believe that they're only doing, uh, at this point, uh, outreach and uh, positive track record. Um, so perhaps that is one, one of the differentiators that may be offsetting um, them. But um, is there anybody or efforts, or could you mention, um, relative to their operations, um, in terms of labor agreements for the operating piece? Everybody seems to be focused a lot on the construction uh, uh, trades, but how about um, the, the car dealers and the hospitality workers? I, I would, I believe I have a sense of what letters may have been included in the application, but I'd rather go back and be sure and come Fair back enough. to you with a list of what those are. Okay. Because I think each applicant has letters and maybe agreements that, uh, you know, we can <coughs> give more detailed information back on. Thank you. All right. Um, again, I, I think it bears repeating that all applicants were capable of operating a, a successful Category 2 slots parlor our certain percentage of new jobs in external <laughs> business development and tourism impacts are going to re accrue regardless of who's selected because of uh, what we've all seen as a pent-up demand in Massachusetts. Uh, we have <coughs> consistently heard in public hearing after public hearing the question about how this commission can select an operator that would meet the promises of jobs and revenues expressed to the Commonwealth and a host community. And in conjunction with the financial analysis presented earlier, an applicant could set themselves apart by providing realistic projections for employment. Uh, success in other jurisdictions uh, needed to be demonstrated and strong evidence that an applicant uh, could effectively translate their successful strategies into substantive action uh, plans in Massachusetts. Uh, we were looking for applicants to, again, have an understanding of relationships and potential partnerships here in Massachusetts to help a new licensee hit the ground running uh, 
was also essential. Finally, uh, each applicant started off on the same footing again. We wanted them to demonstrate how you will be a successful slots parlor licensee in Massachusetts. If there needs to be some differentiation, the additional business strategies would need to be considered. For two of our applicants, Plainville and Raynham, this would be a continuation of horse racing in one form or another. For Lemonster, this was the final financial support of the M3D3 program. Just show again the last uh, ratings by category. Uh, with input from my reviewers, I've rated the applicant, two applicants very good for their ability to achieve our uh, economic development objectives. Uh, Commissioner, by reading that, do you view, I know very good can mean, it's a, it's a, it's a broad range, so in your assessment, are Lemonster and Plainville equal in this category? There is no distinction, or do you have other thoughts on that? I think there were both. Uh, I, I think each had uh, varying strengths within their application. Uh, I can give you some anecdotal evidence where one might have had a leg up on another. Uh, I, I, you know, Lemonster's uh, agreement with the Arc of Opportunity, an organization we heard about when we went out there to help underemployed and unemployed individuals, uh, was probably more of a detailed plan than I could recall us finding under the Plainville section. So I think as we went through it, uh, you know, Plainville, I think, has, uh, has made more substantive progress with respect to the labor issues. And, coming up actually is the only one with a project labor agreement with the building trades. That, in my estimation, maybe give them, gave them a slight edge up in that category specifically under job creation. So there certainly are, you know, fine details and anecdotal points between both of their applications that one would maybe outweigh the other. But uh, again, to kind of give it an overall category rating, I think both of those uh, organizations perform very strongly. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Maybe to, yeah. it's a process question. Um, I, I was very interested in this memo that Rob Scarpelli prepared for you, Commissioner, regarding mm -hmm. um, the, the economic development components of the Category 2 applications not tied to the slot machines. Um, I know you mentioned them, um, but I found this memo to be um, uh, important and it helped me understand some of the uh, other amenities um, and I, I would um, I, I don't know that all the commissioners had a chance to look at this memo um, and I, I I think it's important for tomorrow but I, I would just like Rob to talk a little bit about it if that makes sense now or tomorrow I, I don't know um, when that would make sense as far as uh, mm -hmm. what? I I we could make that information available, but I, I, I'd rather take a moment and maybe make it available for tomorrow after we have a chance to have legal counsel review it and see if there's anything that needs to be redacted. Okay, that'd be fine, thank you. Or maybe you can even do, do that during lunch. It'd be nice if we could get all of our base data out of, the, out of the way today so that sure. tomorrow we answer questions and deliberate. Um, sure. So if, if you can have that conversation during lunch, then we'll start off with that after lunch. Okay. We, we can certainly see it even if there are things yes. to be redacted. Well, you can give it to the commissioners, yeah. Well, no, that means you're using it. No, no, we're not here. I'm not, I'm not talking about using it here. Okay. I mean, it could be distributed to all of us uh, today. So it could much, be yeah. regarded as the way there has to be any redactions. Yeah. I just found it to be particularly helpful to understanding the issues. Well, here, John is suggesting um, that if I do my presentation now, which won't be terribly long, but you know, who knows what kind of Q&A we'll have, that that would give the applicants the maximum time um, to get back to staff with questions and then staff to review the questions, uh, save an hour if we did that before lunch. So if you're, maybe what we ought to do is take a very quick break and then I'll come back and if, if you're all right with that, I'll do yeah. my presentation. I, I think that's an excellent idea. Okay, so then we'll, we'll after we'll do my presentation, then lunch, and after lunch, 
maybe uh, you all can be ready, if you can be ready to make that presentation. Sure. All right, so we will be back in five minutes. All right, we're ready to resume now, please, uh, with the uh, 100 and something uh, public meeting. Uh, the break is concluded, and we'll turn now to the final presentation, uh, which is the overview presentation, category one, sometimes, as we've said before, known as the wow factor. Uh, Chairman Crosby. Thank you very much. Um, let's Let's go to the first slide. There were nine questions in the overview uh, section as opposed to the many, many more that were in the other four evaluation categories. So we didn't need to do any grouping of the questions into subsets. We'll just look at each of the individual questions. And when we get to each of the questions, I'll read it out loud so people are familiar with the details of the question. Um, for reasons which will become clearer as I talk about this, um, rather than hire professional consultant teams, what we did was put together a group of uh, just interested, quite uh, different p kinds of people with, with broad experience and a lot of kind of related policy issues, but no particular expertise relating to any particular one of our questions, just people who would be representative of thoughtful perspectives from across the Commonwealth who would help us make these um, judgments about these nine questions. And the people were in, uh, Teresa Chong, who's a senior development coordinator at the Asian American Civic Association. Phil Clay, Dr. Phil Clay, who's a professor of city planning at MIT, was the provost at MIT. Liz Devlin, who in her night and even afternoon work, uh, uh, night and, and weekend work, is founder and digital curator of Flux Boston, an arts organization, but she's very much a left brain and right brain person, and she works as a financial analyst during the day. Ruth Ellen Fitch is a former corporate attorney and was president for several years of the Dimmock Community Health Center. John Harthorne is the founder and CEO of Mass Challenge, an incubator entrepreneurial sponsorship organization. Ira Jackson, is, uh, took my place as Dean of the McCormick Graduate School at UMass Boston. John Mullen, Professor of Regional Planning and also has held some high-level administrative positions at UMass Amherst. Lily Mendez Morgan is the Chief Operating Officer of the Massachusetts Red Cross. And Joe Thompson is Director of the Mass Museum of Contem Contemporary Art, Mass MOCA, uh, out in North Adams. Um, this group uh, met a number of times uh, to discuss the questions but also we met with um, representatives of the other evaluation teams where we needed more information. You'll see that a lot of our questions um, relate to questions like, for example, the degree to which we promote tourism, the uh, applicants promote tourism, and in order to get, but the, the answers were relatively s short in our uh, questions, sometimes cross-referenced questions in other evaluation categories. So we had very productive presentations from the uh, teams uh, of the other evaluation teams in some case, cases. Next. Uh, forgive my text-heavy slides, but basically I just wanted to give a sense of what this category is about. As Commissioner McHugh said, we have colloquially referred to this category as the wow factor category. In general, what we were looking for when we, the commissioners, put these questions together was to see what we could get out of the applicants for all of the licenses that went well above the basics of the proposals, of, of, the, of the legislation, of the requirements. Finance, mitigation, economic development, site and building designs are the heart, and are the, the bones and muscle, if you will, of a proposal, the blocking and tackling of the proposal. We were looking for things that were beyond that or maybe such extremely good performance in one of those categories that they went way above and beyond, excuse me, the basics. Um, the characterization of, of a wow factor is much less applicable as it turns out to the slots parlor applicants. Um, we specifically talk about destination resort casinos in this question. And these are not destination resort casinos. These are uh, sm relatively small, uh, sh largely regional slots facilities only, 
with neither the capital investment nor the upside revenue opportunity to, to, to uh, permit very much reaching way outside the box, way beyond the basics of the facility. Um, nevertheless, we ask our applicants here, th these, these questions will be much more relevant when we get to the Category 1 licenses than they are to the Category 2. Nevertheless, um, we did ask our applicants to stretch and to understand what we were looking for, how we were trying to get people to, the applicants to reach beyond the basics and to tie their work into the categories of the questions that we were coming up with. And indeed there was, um, there was some. Um, but you'll see as we answer the questions uh, that we gave some uh, uh, slack to the applicants that they didn't really have to spend too much time on some of these questions since they are less applicable. Next. We ended up, um, our, our team, um, in many of the questions, we end up kind of looking for values, senses, judgments. It's not just a series of particulars. There are no yes, no questions, no on-off switch questions, of which there are a number in some of the other categories. Um, but by sort of standing above all of the work that the other evaluation teams were doing, um, or aside of it, I don't mean above it, but aside it, uh, it gave us an opportunity to draw some kind of general conclusions. And given the nature of these people, all generalists, not specialists, uh, looking at a sort of a high level of public policy development, um, it was a natural process that out of this group came some suggestions. I will say, however, that it should be clear that these are, these are ultimately my conclusions and not theirs. Um, I've mentioned this in, in talking to the Commissioner Zuniga in the finance section. Um, we, we concluded that although there are very different debating arguments about the strategic location of each facility, it was our judgment, and we specifically made a point of saying we're looking for people who have more and deeper expertise on this, but it was our judgment that the location of the uh, facility in Lemonster uh, had the greatest competitive strategic value because it served an unserved part of the state, unserved in a lot of ways, having to do with gaming, but other ways as well. Created a bulwark to a potential Southern New Hampshire facility, which was not something that was discussed uh, in the finance section. Um, and uh, as we'll talk more about, uh, had a really interesting perspective relative to the regional economic development role that it might play. A second conclusion that we uh, came to and I particularly felt was worth noting is that the respect and appreciation afforded to Mr. Carney by the citizens and businesses of Raynham and the surrounding communities was quite striking. I think we all noticed that. And there was a clear sense from our group that this should be noted as a factor on behalf of the Raynham proposal. Um, we talked about uh, urging, one of the questions is urging the applicants to support other leading industries in Massachusetts. If they could, again, it's much more relevant for the casino applications. The Raynham and Plainville proposals did not particularly highlight their support of harness racing as a competitive advantage in terms of supporting an existing Massachusetts industry. But indeed, it is an existing Massachusetts industry, and it's something which should be credited strongly to their proposals. The Cordish folks uh, did not have anything that was in gen in endemic to their industry, and they came up with this uh, quite uh, uh, interesting idea of the M3D3, which I'll talk more about. Um, that, but we considered that quite a creative and innovative idea. Next um, slide. This is a kind of an interesting and subtle, subtle one, but there, as has been discussed, the Plainville and Raynham sites had overwhelming support from the host community and in most cases, not all, but in most cases the surrounding communities. The Lemonster site uh, was more controversial both within the host community and within some of the surrounding communities. And some of that controversy continues and we see that throughout our correspondence uh, with citizens of the, of the region and even pub some public officials. But the site on which essentially the 
casino sits, or the slots parlor sits, was previously permitted for and was expected to be developed into a very large mall developed by the Pyramid Mall developers. Um, so the folks who live around there had reason to be prepared to know that something substantial was going to be coming here. Um, and it seemed to us that the concern about this facility, at least some of the concern about this facility, needed to be taken, uh, considered in the perspective about other future likely uses of this site and what other uses and, and uh, utilization of this site folks had a right to, had a, had a reasonable expectation of having anticipated um, so that this didn't, wasn't just dropped out of the sky as a whole new idea. The next one is our uh, advisors talked a lot about trying to say, you know, what, what do we, what do we want to get out of these proposals? We know we want to get revenues. We want to get, we know we want to get jobs. But um, what would we, what would be a success when this gets done? If we look back five years later and we're we're awarding a renewal, what kind of performance would it be that we would measure as particularly value in assessing how this thing had gone? Uh, and we came up with four in particular, nothing surprising. Generating good jobs at living wages or better with substantial re retention rates, excuse me, thus reducing unemployment in the region. Increasing home values both by increasing demand and by increasing favorable amenities in the area. Developing and leading a coherent economic development plan for the region. This is something we'll talk about quite a bit. Uh, and developing a positive collaborative relationship with regional travel and tourism facilities which nets to growth for all. Those were the criteria that we thought were um, particularly important. Next. Um, I'm going to read this. In summary, there was some skepticism in my advisory group about the wisdom of a standalone slots parlor, which is basically neither here nor there. But the group set aside that skepticism to look for the strengths in each of the proposals and expressed a clear wish that the winning bidder would be available to partner with people of goodwill in the region and the Commonwealth to build on the strengths of their proposals, to solidify commitments that are made in the heat of the competitive process, and to develop a strong work regional working relationship that will keep any negative impacts of the slots parlor to the barest possible minimum and to build a better economic future for the people of the region. And I think as we go along, you'll see um, how that became uh, sort of an important summary. All right. There are nine questions. Um, again, forgive the small type, but I'll read question one, the Massachusetts brand. How does the project you propose manifest an appreciation for and collaboration with the existing Massachusetts brand, i.e., our intellectual knowledge economy, our biomedical, life sciences, educational, and financial service sectors, as economic drivers and our long history of innovation and, and economic regeneration over the 400 years of our existence. We felt that the Lemister proposal uh, was rated very good on this category. This is where the M3D3, this is an investment uh, of a, a million dollars or more, a million to a million and a half dollars, into a challenge grant program for entrepreneurial medical device industries, having identified a medical device corridor from Lowell to Worcester, um, which has many, many medical device companies in it and which, which uh, benefit from the nanotechnology and other technologies at UMass Lowell and the medical research that's done at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Um, we thought that was a, a really innovative um, creative idea, very much compatible with Massachusetts' culture of innovation and, and economic regeneration. Uh, the proposal, as uh, Commissioner Stebbins talked about, was very sensitive to and understood the gateway strategy, what it's about, how Massachusetts has made a priority out of identifying gateway cities that have certain economic characteristics and, and has mandated that the resources of the Commonwealth to some extent be focused on the, the gateway cities. This proposal, the Lemister proposal, really understood this. Um, and, and we'll talk more about this, a very clear appreciation that North Central Mass, um, the, the Lemonster, Fitchburg, Gardner, three city area, and a surrounding arc 
really is a coherent, albeit at this stage of the game in particular, underdeveloped region. Uh, and the Lemister proposal had a good appreciation for, for that um, situation and its potential role in improving it. Plainville, uh, we judge to be sufficient. sufficient. Um, it clearly benefits uh, from uh, supporting racing and agriculture. Those are very much a part of the Massachusetts brand. Harness racing is a, has been a part of Massachusetts history for a long time. Our agricultural industry, which supports harness racing, which is horse farms and, and uh, blacksmith shops and so forth, uh, that's part of Massachusetts brand and Plainville uh, will clearly con contribute strongly to that. Plainville also uh, talked about recycling the quarry, about having good green policies as innovations as themes. Um, those uh, recycling of old facilities and green innovation are uh, important Massachusetts characteristics. Rain and we thought was sufficient. It also benefits from the racing and agriculture uh, by virtue of its commitment to continue some degree of harness racing, at least in Brockton and clearly uh, Mr. Carney's understanding of the importance and the commitment to that industry. Uh, and they too, more in a sort of a generic sense, uh, rather than very many specifics, promoted the history of innovation and promoted local vendor support, which was dramatic in the case of Raynham. But bottom line, our judgment was, uh, my judgment is, that uh, Lemonster was very good in that, better than other two. Destination resort, well, this is where we talked about how the legislation calls for destination resort casinos. The question reads, some visionaries in the gaming industry, in the gaming business, describe an evolution of gaming facilities from convenience casinos to destination resorts to city integrated resorts. Explain what, if any, meeting city integrated resorts has to you and how you anticipate following its principles if in fact you subscribe to them. Additionally, please explain how the project you propose embraces the legislature's mandate to present destination resort casinos rather than convenience casinos. We made this question optional for the um, category two applicants because it's really a stretch for the kind of facilities that they are developing, but they all did respond. We, um, we used uh, pluses and minuses to nuance the, the three, uh, the four categories a little bit. We judged Lemonster sufficient plus uh, in terms of the destination resort question. Um, they do have the three restaurants and a small entertainment venue. They, they, they seem to be making a coherent effort to take what is basically going to be a slots parlor and add other amenities to it to give it a broader appeal. Um, and we gave them a sufficient plus. Plainville we gave a very good because it uh, aggressively promotes its tie-ins with the other major regional attractions and harness racing, tried to create much a, a whole much greater than the sum of the parts. Exactly how that works and how credible that is, that's why I asked the question about whether, Commissioner Stebbins, there are in fact signed, signed agreements with those other venues, but the, the thrust and the strategy and the appreciation that something could, dramatic could be done here, um, we thought gave them uh, a rating of very good. Uh, we thought Arenum was sufficient. It, it, it did talk about being a community integrated resort. Um, it was kind of modest in its aspiration. Uh, did promise the partial harness season. It had this, and other, others have talked about this, it has this large uh, event space that's, that wasn't very well explained exactly how that was going to get used, what that function was. It's phase three and four um, parts of the application that could conceivably have big development and the South Coast Rail are extraordinary, but they're A, doubtful, and, and B, you know, not committed to and way down the road. Outward looking, question one, three, how do you propose to merge the creation of a destination resort casino or slots parlor with the concept of creating an outward looking physical structure that is an establishment that relates to and is integrated with the host and surrounding communities, leverages Massachusetts existing assets and enhances and coordinates with Massachusetts existing tourism and other leisure venues. This was the question we, we put together, we commissioners put together, because we've, we've made a major point of continuing the industry trend of breaking away from the big closed box facility and rather develop facilities which are highly integrated with other resources in the community. This is where we were trying to elicit this question. 
uh, elicit this answer. We gave, um, I gave uh, Lemister a very good on this. Um, they, they looked at it at first, as they all three did, as, as we were talking about the physical plant, which was part of what we were looking, to talk, looking at. They talked about the quality landscaping, the outward opening doors, which I think Commissioner McHugh talked about. You can access the restaurants from, from any which way. You don't have to go through the casino facility. Um, they come from uh, a mall development uh, ex um, ex professional expertise. That's what their, the Cordes companies principally does. Uh, and that's what their facility is in Maryland. Um, they have a mall-like culture in the way they approach their, their developments and I think aspirations for, uh, for mall development. Um, they also had, and I'll talk more about this, a very strong sense, it seemed to me, uh, of, the, of the region itself as a coherent region and as a, co a collaborator in the marketing of, of that region. Plainville, we gave a um, S plus to VG, sufficient plus to very good. Plainville promotes, again, the continued reuse of the quarry, the maintenance of track and racing, the historic design considerations, and cross-marketing with regional uh, venues. Um, they have a track record of being uh, relatively collaborative neighbors to with their local support. Uh, we gave uh, Rainham a insufficient plus. Um, they did stress their community marketing ties and their hopes for the long-term rail development, but really didn't um, articulate a very coherent uh, notion of how they would integrate the operations of the facility with the uh, surrounding operations, tourism and so forth. Competitive environment, this is the question that overlaps with Commissioner Zuniga's question. Um, the question reads, describe the competitive environment in which you anticipate operating over the next 10 years and how you plan to succeed in that environment without taking revenues away from other Massachusetts gaming establishments, racetracks, or businesses. We gave uh, Lemonster a very good plus on this. Uh, this it was, it was my reading of this, and our advisors felt the same way, that Lemonster demonstrated the, the highest marginal competitive advantage comparing one to another. Um, number one, it's going gonna, it's gonna to serve an un, a relatively unserved area. If there isn't something in North Central Mass, um, that will be a relatively unserved area. It will be vulnerable to substantial leaking to southern New Hampshire um, if and when, and I think it's probably pretty likely, there is a Southern New Hampshire facility. Um, it minimizes, by virtue of its location, it minimizes cannibal cannibalization of the oncoming uh, Massachusetts facilities. Uh, and uh, we believed that the Region C resort <laughs> casino, whether that's a commercial casino or whether that's a tribal casino, would have a greater potential to recapture and retain southeastern mass uh, dollars from uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut than would uh, a quality, even a quality slots parlor. So there was a better way to fight uh, and recapture and repatriate dollars from uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, we judged Plainville um, sufficient on this. They are at put it mildly, a proven successful casino operator. They talked about their customer lists, which would have some benefit here. They talked about their ability to compete with Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, at least in my section, and I'm not sure whether this was true elsewhere, there was really minimal attention paid in the application by, um, by uh, Plainville to what happens when there is a Southeastern Mass casino and no mention of the possibility of the Taunton community, of the casino. Was that different? Yeah, I was nodding because that's true for your section, but not true for the finance section. Okay. Uh, the applicant in the projections uh, does take into account uh, competition, uh, specifically well, they, uh, the they, possibility they, of Taunton. They uh, talk about how they have dropped, but do, do they talk at all about how they would compete, you know, how they, what they propose to do to protect their position against uh, 
southeastern mass encroachment? Yeah, with uh, uh, you know in their operational and business plans, okay. which which I can get into more detail. I thought you know I did to some degree uh, yesterday, but uh, there is a recognition that um, that they will be affected by the introduction of either a commercial or a tribal uh, okay. uh, um, operation. Um, was that also true of the Raynham proposal? Yeah, to a lesser degree, though, and uh, we, we we'll we'll talk about this um, tomorrow because we got a question, uh, I believe, on this on this matter. Okay. Um, so, Raynham, um, in our section, you know, it's interesting. In a question about competitive environment, there was no, on these two folks, there was no mention of the southeastern mass competition. Um, in that area, Raynham didn't mention the southeastern mass, Taunton, or Rhode Island, Connecticut. It did cite Greenwood Racing's experience and Carney's experience and past performance, did have letters of support, um, and did talk about maintaining harness racing and, and simulcast, um, but really in our section didn't do a very aggressive or thoughtful job of talking about how they deal with the competitive environment. Question number five, uh, meeting unmet needs. How do you propose to work with affiliated attractions and amenities to broaden the market base of the gaming facility and to meet unmet needs in our array of entertainment, education, and leisure, leisure resources. Again, the commissioners put this question in here back way back when we put together the evaluation criteria, particularly thinking about the casinos. You know, what else are you going to have? What other kinds of entertainment venues? If you remember the, uh, the, the Mohegan Sun plan in Palmer had a water park that was going to be a part of it. That was the kind of thing we were looking for, a little bit less applicable than it is for the uh, slot spallers. Nevertheless, um, there were responses. Um, Lemonster, we rated very good. Um, we thought, and uh, this is a recurring theme now that, that it was very significant in my assessment of these applications. There was an appreciation, it, it appeared a real appreciation of this discrete tourism industry in that region. Uh, and a fair amount of talk about affiliating with the, the redeveloped Great Wolf Lodge and working with the Johnny Appleseed Trail, Trail Association and an appreciation of um, the relationship that could be developed with the North, North Central Mass, uh, particularly tourist organizations. Um, Plainville uh, talked aggressively about uh, cross-promoting, particularly with the major venues um, and and talked about increased vis visitation in and of itself being a regional catalyst, um, but there was not much specificity on what, how exactly that was going to work. And as I said, we never could quite figure out whether this, uh, there was real teeth to this proposal or not. Um, Rainham um, promoted the impact of its, of its new entertainment venue, although not readily des described. Uh, and collaboration with the community colleges for job development. They went out of their way to make that point. Collaborative marketing. The question is, how do you intend to market aggressively outside Massachusetts and internationally, perhaps in cooperation with our existing industries and organizations such as Massport and the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism, and certainly in collaboration with our existing institutional drivers of economic and international development? Again, more applicable to the casinos than to the slots parlors. Um, Lemonster stated, we thought, quite realistically that their market is really a 60-mile market. Um, they, um, they were the only ones that made a point of saying, as a practical matter, our market is, is really 60 miles. But within that radius, um, I thought that they did a very good job of pushing the marketing partnerships and, as I've said before, the, the promotion of the North Central Mass region. Um, they did have uh, a fair discussion about aspirations for marketing relations with Massport. I'm not sure how realistic that was, um, but the, it was a big section that they focused on. Penn um, talked about marketing the Penn National Database. Um, aggressively talked about going after Rhode Island customers, uh, and talked about regional and local motor coach operations, and talked generally, generally about advertising and cross promotions. Um, we thought that Rainham uh, had relatively few specifics on marketing strategies, basically said, if you build a good facility, they will come. That was kind of the, the business proposition. If we run a really good facility, people will come. There was little focus on Rhode Island or Connecticut. 
Um, it did talk about and made a sort of a tacit commitment to coordination with state, local, and regional tourism organizations and area businesses. Question number seven is diverse workforce and supplier base. Describe your commitment to a diverse workforce and supplier base and an inclusive approach to marketing operations and training practices that will take advantage of the broad range of skills and experiences represented in our Commonwealth's evolving profile, further identify and discuss the diversity within the leadership and ownership of the applicant, if any. Um, on the latter score, uh, the leadership and ownership of the companies, uh, there was nothing, there was next to nothing, if not nothing. Um, and I, it was notable, I would say, the lack of diversity in ownership and leadership. Um, as to their workforces and supplier base, and you've heard some of this, we were looking for somebody that would really go above and beyond uh, the norms here. Um, Lemonster took the project, relative, took the, the task relatively seriously. Um, from my own field trip to Maryland, I could see that their employee base for sure uh, was remarkably diverse. They talked about their track record in Maryland. Their formal uh, written policies are good policies. Um, they did not give us, and I am gathered they didn't any place else, uh, come up with real hard specific numbers to which they can be held accountable. They certainly at least didn't within our area, uh, within, within my sections. Um, they went out of their way to partner with this uh, arc of opportunity. Uh, and many people from ARC showed up at many of our events, uh, and I think that, that, that showed a real honest and interesting attempt to be real in this business, uh, to identify hard to employ, underemployed, in their case particularly disabled uh, folks, and to make a good faith effort to make that meaningful. Um, Plainville uh, uh, rated about the same. Uh, they had uh, very strong promises and uh, about what they were doing, and there was a lot of documentation about what they had done elsewhere, but for some reason or other, and this one and others did this, uh, Rainham and Plainville both did this, they didn't really bring any of the material, didn't even really cross-reference the material. Um, however, there was a lot of documentation elsewhere in the application about um, strong performances in workforce and supplier base in their other facilities. Um, Raynham gave very little detail, a uh, little bit of track record, few specifics, few, uh, few standardized policies. They have made a, some kind of an arrangement with the NAACP and the representative of the NAACP came to one or more of our meetings uh, and again that's indicative of taking this issue at, at, at good faith but the answers were not very substantive. And question number um, Eight, uh, number eight, broadening the region's um, tourism appeal. What is your overall perspective and strategy for broadening the appeal of your region and the Commonwealth to travelers inside and outside of Massachusetts? Somewhat of a repetitive question from the others. Um, but the takeaway from Lemonster uh, was that if they mean what they say um, and if they keep their commitments, that this facility really could become a leader in developing this underdeveloped uh, and, and hurting area. Um, they could become a leader in North Central Mass, and they could become a leader in the development of the gateway strategy for Lemonster. Uh, Plainville, um, again, talked a lot about coordinating with the other venues uh, central to their, which was central to their strategy, the Gillettes and the Comcasts. Uh, they have a lot of talk about the, collaborative marketing with similar facil other facilities. They have a track record of successful collaboration between racing and gaming and other jurisdictions, and they did reach out to, it seemed like, uh, to Mott and uh, made a commitment to work with the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. The uh, answer from Raynham was uh, largely a restatement of the point that if you do a good job, people, that will take care of itself. If you run a really great facility, um, that will help. Uh, they. They had a number of sort of routine references to cross-marketing and collaboration, and they did have a number of let support letters from other facilities in the area, um, but it, it was not a particularly inspired response. Question number nine was asked about post-licensing um, needs. 
uh, we didn't maybe do a very good job of this, but one of the, we were interested, for example, in what our applicants, what we, the, the commissioners, we were interested in what our applicants thought about, for example, the future of internet gaming, that kind of thing. None of the responses um, were particularly meaningful, so we didn't even bother rating them to this, to this question. So the summary um, is, um, To reiterate, um, we were looking for bidders to go outside the, the norm, outside what's expected. We understood that uh, this is less relevant to this group. Nevertheless, you know, you do want to try to get a sense of how folks are thinking, what they're thinking about, how do their minds work, are they creative, are they innovative, did they understand what we were getting at, did they try to accomplish that? Um, we rated uh, Lemonster overall uh, a very good minus, uh, which was the highest rating. Um, in the context of the relatively modest applicability of these questions to the Category 2 applicants, the Cordish responses stood out, and they earned the highest rating in seven of the eight questions that we rated. The, the applicant demonstrated a, a very, I thought, uh, coherent sense of the Lowell to Worcester Crescent as an economic unit of the Lemonster Fitchburg Gardner area and surrounding area as a tourist unit and has reasonable aspirations to anchor regional, regional economic development. And for what it's worth, um, in the final analysis, um, I judged the Lemonster proposal to be the most effective regional location for the gaming facility on the theory that in the long run, the, the region is least likely to be served by any other facility. Um, it will serve as a competitive buffer to southern New Hampshire facility um, and that there are likely to be stronger buffers for Massachusetts in the casino or casinos that will eventually occur in southeastern Mass. Plainville uh, I rated as sufficient to sufficient plus. Uh, the strength of the Plainville proposal clearly is its commitment to maintaining the harness track and that's important uh, and the broad support for that track and the facility within the neighboring communities and the, and the harness industry. Uh, the applicant tried very hard to establish a regional appeal with the stop, shop, and play concept, which had a lot to do with affiliating with these other venues. Uh, it's a concept which the evaluation team and I found a little bit too difficult to assess in its impact. You can sort of hear the words, hard to quite exactly figure out what that means. Uh, Rainham, the Greenwood Racing proposal was often minimally responsive to the questions and seemed to make uh, not very much effort to tie the components of the application in a meaningful way back into questions one through nine. The singular strength of the Rainham proposal is the distinguished business record of Mr. Carney and the virtually unanimous and genuine support that he has in Rainham and nearby communities. Most of the specific questions in the category were addressed with relatively little substance or imagination. That's it. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back to number one to start. Uh, with respect to the uh, Plainville uh, 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 rating, uh, uh, green energy, uh, uh, recyclables, uh, the like, that, that's part of the Massachusetts brand, and we consider ourselves first in the universe on that. And uh, Plainville so has uh, first in the universe on lots of things. Yes, well, I know, but that's just one of one of one of a broad array of right. uh, things. Plainville has a very uh, aggressive uh, renewable program. Uh, I didn't mention it yesterday, but they're the only ones that have at the front door a, a metering system, so that everybody coming in and out of the front door can look and see what their energy usage is and and where it's uh, coming from and and the like. They have that. Uh, renewable um, uh, uh, thing for the for the drain water. Uh, the question is, uh, was that taken into a, their, their high a degree of uh, energy around renewables? Uh, yeah. Was that taken into a? Yeah, I mentioned like, specifically here good green policies. I know, but oh. there was only four words. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm uh, just it's in terms of the, the relative uh, uh, three words. Uh, I, and just in terms of the, of the um, what, I guess, why did, why did you feel that, that uh, Lemnister trumped that? 
because well, two, of the uh, because of the out of the box thinking around yeah, two, M3D3. There's two things. The the good green policies that the um, Plainville uses gets them high marks in your category. It's not really supporting. I mean, we. I think we sort of gave them a benefit that they're picking on something that's important in Massachusetts culture, but they're not doing any, anything to support the green industry in Massachusetts. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a good thing, and, you know, there's a cumulative effect, and the more people that get behind this, the better it is, and so in that sense, it's a good thing. But it's, it's really not supporting the industry per se, not what we were looking for. The, the Massachusetts uh, Lemonster won on this category just simply because this – they obviously sat down and said, look, there's nothing endemic to our business that relates to the financial services world, higher education, biotech. There's no, there's no reach there. But we heard what the commission is looking for, so we're going we're gonna to reach out and make one up. Um, and it was a pretty interesting idea, we thought. All right. Got it. Uh, in uh, category number three, uh, again, uh, Plainville. Uh, uh, did you take into account in in the the uh, you stressed heavily uh, and rightly in my view the outward lookingness of uh, the Lemister facility right. with the two restaurants and the like? Did you take into account in reaching the rating for uh, Plainville the fact that uh, the uh, sports bar and pub has an outward uh, uh, entrance as well? Yeah, yeah, but it it was. These are hard to compare, and these are these are no, really, I these are I really just... marginal points. But, but the, well. the, the 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 fact of the the three of the two restaurants on either side of the facilities and the entertainment venue, um, but as I said, we weren't I wasn't we weren't really looking for the physical building itself, except with respect to making it accessible. Yes, that. But we were looking for relationships with the surrounding industries. Well, um, and we thought they did well on both. Okay. Um, I'll come to that in just a second. It, we, we talked a minute ago when uh, Commissioner Stebbins was uh, uh, presenting his uh, 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 analysis about the, the seed money kind of concept. And uh, uh, we talked a, a little bit about the uh, uh, kind of uh, spin-off or throw-off M3-D3 could produce as, in terms of seed capital. Does that, does that uh, principle hold true um, in other areas as well? Uh, for example, if, if uh, one of these facilities needs 100,000 uh, loaves of bread in, in a year, uh, might that uh, spark some small bakery to say, if I had a contract for 100,000 loaves of bread, I could expand and I could get more business on top of that. I can't go any place uh, uh, beyond where I am now unless I get that kind of a plat guaranteed platform. Does it work across, um, does, does, the, does the sort of uh, seed money work across um, uh, supply contracts like that? Or did you think about that? Or is well, I hadn't really thought about it in this context. I mean, I, I would say we think about it all the time with respect to the business development stuff. You know, we're hoping to try to find Probably not startup businesses, but small businesses that that could grow substantially with a big bread contract, and make sure that they're prepared. Make sure they know what's coming. Make sure they know how to deal with the kinds of the uh, contractual negotiations that they might have to go through. So, yeah, I think it would be. I think the whole the, the legislature's whole idea here is to be able to generate growth in local businesses by promoting by pumping in new dollars. Yeah, no, I, I know that it is, but, it, but in the analysis that I've heard so far, uh, it seems to me, and maybe I'm missing something, that we've been focused largely, with the exception of the M3D3, on direct spending and the amount of jobs that that direct spending will support or even create in the uh, area, rather than uh, taking the next step and saying that that direct spending will provide seed money or a guaranteed floor that will allow businesses to build and expand beyond the seed money so that you get seed money of X or contract money of X will allow you to get other contracts of Y and uh, have a total revenue uh, increase of X plus Y. And, and I don't know whether that f formed a part of your analysis or whether it's even possible to make that kind of analysis. We didn't know. We did not. This was this question came up under Massachusetts brand, and that you know that's not really um, 
at least that's not the way we were looking at it. I, we, did, we didn't look at that kind of ripple effect. I think, it, I think Commissioner Stebbins does to some extent. Yeah, we, we, we had a, Mike, a, yeah. a wide variety of uh, expected outside expenditures in small business and where they hope to spend that money. I think that was evident in some of the terms that were negotiated in the host and surrounding community agreements. So everybody had differing figures. Uh, but I didn't come across anybody who, you know, each, uh, each applicant suggested different strategies and different detail about how they wanted to work with small business, splitting bid packages, uh, you know, faster repayment of, uh, of invoices, et cetera. Uh, there wasn't anybody who said, I got a particular amount of money to help out, you know, to lend to a potential vendor. There wasn't any specific details to that type of program, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, no, I, I was not talking about lending. I was talking about the ripple effect of direct dollars. And, and I was thinking about, uh, you know, what effect does uh, purse money have, for example, in uh, the racing uh, area on the ability of uh, farmers to stay in business and, and also uh, uh, and thereby um, uh, create a product that can be used in multiple jurisdictions. You can't do it without a guarantee that you can buy enough feed for the horses, but if you can have that guarantee, you can do things elsewhere. Well, maybe we can talk about that tomorrow. Anyway. In, in number five, um, um, the, um, the uh, as I understood it, the Plainville had the play, stay, and shop which is directly related to the Warren, um, uh, uh, the Warren malls there, uh, it seems to me, or at least most directly. Rentham. I'm in the Rentham, Warren, Rentham, Rentham <laughs> malls, at least most directly tied to that. Yep. Uh, but there also is um, an effort that I thought I detected in their approach uh, to the sports side, and the whole uh, point of the, sp uh, of the Flutie Club pub was to tie in to Gillette uh, to the TPC um, and to use uh, and to capitalize on that. And then there's the Comcast Center, which is not really a sporting venue. But it seemed to me that they had uh, both a, um, uh, a hook out, uh, they were trolling uh, for um, attracting people to both uh, to, uh, the combined effect of them and the shopping and them and the sports. And I just wondered how that compared. Um, uh, it's a very narrow margin of difference that you have there. Yeah. Uh, 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 why, why you felt that the, um, that the uh, Lemnister proposal uh, had a greater weight uh, yeah. in, in that kind of Again, these, these are margins. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, we're talking, we're talking thin differences. But, right. but I can't, I didn't see the evidence of these relationships. You know, I hear it, and it sort of sounds good. But I, that's why I'm asking, you know, is there backup, you know? There is. Okay. I, I can answer that from mitigation. We have... The basic thing is, is that it's not in mitigation because agreements in that the, they have correct. are not in the, in the mitigation. It was announced in the public hearings, I think, the, the presentations that, that the applicant did listed uh, 10 or so agreements. But, but I've not been able to find any backup under it, certainly under mitigation. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, some of those MOUs are reflected well, in my section. We talked about that earlier. Well, and there, were, there were, for that yeah, we're, we're going to check it. it. Was the big four that the, that they made the big push right. on was right. this big four relation, right. was these big four facilities, right. and and what 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 uh, what I thought Lemonster did was create a a realistic perception that it understood the nature of this region, and that it could be a coherent, collaborative organization. Um, they knew who the key players were, and they they were appear to be committed to working with that and to be a, a player. You know, I I would expect, and you know, this is the kind of thing that I would hold, whether it's Lemons or anybody else. I would expect their GM to be a major player in the North Central Mass business community, um, and to be a player on the Johnny Appleseed Trail Association and so forth, and and help them figure out how to raise this area up. In, in, and it's an area that needs raising up. In the case of the, this relationship, this buy, stop, and shell, sell, or whatever thing, um, again, I hear it, but I didn't see it. I wasn't persuaded that they really had it there. They really understood it. And that the marginal utility to the area, it's not like Gillette Stadium needs a lot of help, whereas 
Johnny Appleseed mm -hmm. Trail needs a lot of help. And we're talking about what's the, the best marginal contribution. Right. Um, so for what it's worth, that was the way I looked at it. Okay, thanks. I just had a couple of quick questions. When you talked about Massachusetts brand, did you consider the Flutie Sports Bar as a Massachusetts <laughs> brand? For those of us sports fans. No, not, not per se, no. Okay. <laughs> and with your competitive uh, environment, um, that's a thought process that you and your advisors had as opposed to any analysis that was completed. Any analysis anywhere close to what they did, yes. I mean, we did analysis, commonsensical analysis, um, by looking at maps and you know knowing the area and so forth. But the reason I put the sentence in there about we look forward to more detail from the other evaluation groups is that we didn't have the resources to do the kind of evaluation that Commissioner Zellinger did. I had a number of questions, and they uh, they stole many of them, uh, my my fellow commissioners. But I did see the the sports brand and the proximity as one that could easily fit in the brand uh, category. And uh, when, when you mention, and we, this is obviously a good discussion perhaps to, to, to continue tomorrow, but when you mention evidence, well, we, we met Doug Flutie. When you mention evidence yeah. about those kinds of commitments, we did meet Doug Flutie when he came to the hearing in, uh, uh, I don't and, doubt that uh, they're gonna before have us. I Flutie bar in the facility. That is the question. The question is, how, do, what, how is there a strategy that I could understand and that they presented of creating a whole greater than the sum of the parts? You know, how is this going to work? And what is the marginal utility to the region as a result of that strategy? And I didn't get either of those. You know, it's not that it isn't there, I just didn't get it, either one of them. It, it, I'm sorry, you do. Yeah. It, it, you know, this question of regional impact somewhat came up again under uh, the economic development consideration. And there was a question, I think, specifically directed at what is your connection or role or how do you plan to participate in a regional economic development effort or a plan? Uh, Bruce, would you pull the mic over? Sure. Um, you know, there was a, one applicant, Raynham, said that no regional plan exists, so we don't know how we would be a partner to something that didn't exist. Uh, where I thought Plainville had an interesting response relative to this question is there is no regional plan, but we're willing to be a thought leader and an organizer around maximizing the benefit of a of, of, of slots parlor coming to that region. Uh, Lemonster, again, in respect to where do they fit into a regional plan, and, 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 and I echo the chairman's comments about their willingness to step up with some of the business organizations and north central uh, Worcester County that they've uh, had signed agreements with, uh, I think only reflected back to a regional goal of better utilizing the area in Lemonster in which they're planning to operate their facility. Right. So, okay. I had a, oh, go ahead. Okay. I had a, a, a quick question under number three, outward looking. Um, uh, could you give me a little more clarification the historic design considerations for a racetrack that's only about 15 years old? Well, they talked about uh, they talked about reusing the quarry, the, the reuse of the quarry. They talked about using granite construction facilities. Okay. They had a they 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 um, recreated the 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 model, the the logo of the city of the town of Plainville. Um, there, they talked about. Um, I, mean, I think they were groping, trying to figure out how to respond to this question. And they talked a lot about the, the historic fabric of the community and, and how they were going to be supportive of that. It, it, it was a, more in the nature of rhetoric than real substance. Okay. Anything else? All right. Then. Um, I guess I will, uh, we will uh, adjourn, for, or, uh, is the food court open? Did somebody say where's, it is, right next door? Okay, so there is, there is a lunch available close, so we don't need to take so long. We'll, we'll take an hour break, come back at two, is that all right? And we will um, pick up with um, whichever it was, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, maybe, on the, um, the uh, discussion. The HLT, uh, no. Discussion that uh, Commissioner uh, Cameron wanted. Sure. So we have given all the applicants two hours from the end of the presentation to get us those, to those comments. Uh, for the purposes of doing some of the evaluations, if those, uh, uh, one recommendation is that we could ask the applicants to get the, the reports to us within two hours. We would have some time for the remainder of the afternoon and for the evening to assemble all of the answers to those if we, if we have that pick from now. 
Yeah. Yeah, so if it wasn't clear, we're now done with the five evaluation presentations. Uh, that is at 1 o'clock. So at 3.05, um, we will close um, feedback from applicants who believe that we have somehow made a mistake of fact in our presentations. And those will go to John, and we will deal with those that you believe we need to deal with uh, tomorrow morning. All right? At the, at the risk of interposing myself between um, now and lunch, uh, how long would it take to deal with uh, that remaining item on our agenda? Which is a discussion of the memo. memo. I mean, if it's 10 minutes. Uh, well, we might want to, we might, they're, we're then going to say, what else? I mean, I don't, there may be other conversations to be had. Oh, all right. I'm, I'm game to whatever anybody wants. Is that the only outstanding issue? Is the discussion of that memo? <clears throat> and are we prepared to do that now? I, oh. Well, so we, yeah, no, we'll, better, we'll, we'll, we'll do it at, at 2.05. Yeah. Okay? Is that right? Do it after lunch? Yeah. If, I mean, do it after lunch? Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene. It's uh, actually Commission Meeting 110, Commissioner McHugh. 110. 110. Yes. And uh, it is a few minutes after 2 o'clock, and we will convene again. Uh, let's see, I guess we're going to start out with the uh, issue that was raised by Commissioner Cameron. Do you want to just reframe it and then we'll in, apparently Rob is going to speak? Yeah, well, this was a memo prepared by HLT, Rob <coughs> in particular, I guess it was a joint effort. Um, I know I had been uh, requesting a, um, a way to uh, place some value on the on the, the, the strengths of the proposals and their additional amenities and, um, uh, un, you know, that were not tied to gaming and how to value those. So this memo was prepared um, uh, and um, I, I thought it was helpful, so I just wanted to make sure everyone uh, saw it and then Rob is here to walk us through it. Um, the, the memo deals with if you think of it in this perspective. Use a mic up close. So you want to use the can, you, podium. can you hear it? Can you hear it? You want to use the podium, Rob? Yeah. Because I think you'll. Oh, yeah, I just, my, eye, my eyesight going back and forth when it progresses. <laughs> um, the origin of the memo is, is, is uh, three commissioners asked related questions related to horse racing or sort of non-slot gaming components of the proposals. Uh, so what we did uh, in relation to that is we took a look at all three proposals and, and if you think about it in this perspective what we did is we stripped away all the slot and related elements of food and beverage entertainment took that out what was left on the proposals and this chart summarizes what was left and what you're really dealing with in terms of uh, uh, Plainville Penn National is an existing horse racing operation what you're dealing with in Parks Raynham is uh, a, a commitment based on a number of conditions to uh, host live racing at the Brockton Fair. Uh, and then in terms of uh, PPE, it's a annual investment amount to um, non-gaming related, non-facility related uh, uh, program in the Lemister area. So what we, what we, how we looked at it was you could look at all these non slot activities and determine uh, they all generate some form of economic benefit. Uh, take it from the perspective of economic benefit is generated through the spending of dollars. And what we did is we looked at how the investment is made, what is the form of, what is the, form of the investment, and how is, it, how is it allocated. We looked at what is the investment used for, uh, what's the end purpose, uh, direct recipients of the investment, indirect recipients of the investment, the quantum of uh, annual investment, timing, what conditions have been what conditions uh, have been included with the application, and also what restrictions might be placed on the light on a, on the license to ensure investment occurs in, in the future. 
So what we're really dealing with in terms of the annual investment, and I'll go from left to right, uh, in terms of Penn National, what they're committing to uh, through their application is, a, is spending of about $13 million on running the horse racing operation. And the breakdown of that $13 million is $2.3 million in year one decreases down to $2.1 million is allocated to purses. So that amount of money goes straight to the winners of races. So it's right to the horse owners, and that pays the trainers and all the way down to the uh, uh, people who own racehorses and work for people who own racehorses. And on top of that, in order to run the racing operation, they're spending another almost $11 million, of which approximately 30% of that is through labor. Uh, jobs at the at the race at the race uh, course from there so in total they're spending about 13 million dollars that will generate benefits on top of that uh, in terms of construction costs because they're improving the facility uh, for the customers to come and watch live racing a portion of that uh, one-time expenditure to improve the facility should be included in economic benefits uh, uh, parks rain and whatever uh, uh, with their proposal to uh, initiate live racing back at the uh, Brockton um, fairgrounds, whatever, they're committing to 40 days of racing, but they did not provide how much allocation of the purses and the expenditures related to that, but there will be annual expenditures related to um, running 40 live race dates. It should be mentioned too, Penn National in their projections have assumed about 100 race days in their projections for the five years. Uh, <coughs> PPE uh, is saying we will commit $1 million, a minimum investment of $1 million. It may rise to $1.5 million, but that's at the discretion, depending on the success of the operation, at the discretion of PPE to the uh, M M2 or M3 D3 uh, program from there. We did not look at, once those investments are made, what are the ripple effects? Uh, going down because that's a, a larger exercise of saying if you spend you know a dollar in purses what's the other economic benefits going down the same token <coughs> about if you spend a, a million dollars in investment for seed money you know that could create jobs later on down the road also we didn't look at that level we just looked at it from the from the surface of how much quantum of dollars are being spent and comparing that annual investment uh, as a, as a way to compare the three different applications or three different bidders. So at this stage, I open it up for questions if anybody has any. At least in the case of Rainham, um, they, they did identify a loan to the Brockton Fair for an initial capital investment. I, I forget if that piece was redacted, but there is a, a, uh, a, an, yes. inf an infusion of cash into that operation uh, that would be parallel to the capital expenditure of um, at Plainville. Correct. That's listed on the on the sheet. Oh, yeah. it would be yeah. a, a capital. Thank you. Capital yeah. investment. It would capital. be a capital we, investment. We just didn't know the annual. There will be annual right. expenditures related to 40 right. live race days. They Correct. Will, they will have to allocate purse money above and beyond the nine percent right. horse fund, and they will have to uh, have expenses to run the paramutual side of the operation and to accommodate customers. So there, there will be expenses there, but they weren't provided. Right. <clears throat> Any other questions from the commission? Is that what you wanted, Commissioner? Uh, I'm just looking at the rest of this to see if there's anything else that, um, yeah. Um. The, uh, I know you have uh, FTEs, but I think that was covered in some of the other presentations, correct? Correct. At, at the race The only piece that we hadn't talked about was the actual financial benefit from uh, racing uh, a full schedule, a partial schedule. Is that? Well, the, there's two elements of the, there's two elements from the racing side of it. If you're looking at economic benefits to the horses, it's money, that's money that the horses generate. Horses, if I, if I simplify, horses only make money through racing for purse money. So $2.3 million in first year decreasing to 2.1 in five years, is that's the money going to the racehorses, and that flows through the owners of the races, their trainers, 
keeping up the horses. It also helps them buy new horses. That's that part of the equation. The $10 million to run the racetrack is not really racing specific. It will be in goods and services to buying equipment, buying uh, uh, equipment and services to maintain the paramutual operation in the other operations of the racetrack component. So it's the 10 million plus the 2.3, is that how you're? Correct. Okay. So roughly 13, $13 million in year one spent on that side. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? Anything else? No. Thank you. Was that Commissioner Cameron? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we are pretty much done for the day. Um, I had a couple of things to talk about, just to you know, think about what tools, if any, we need for tomorrow, and then think about the process for tomorrow. Um, and then we'll adjourn and give ourselves a chance to think about what all we've heard. But are, is there anything else, any other questions, thoughts, observations, ideas? Okay. No, except that, that the, the, we are going to have the answers to the outstanding questions as a first item. Yeah, I'll talk about yeah. that in a okay. second. Right. Okay, great. As far as tools, I've asked for uh, two things to be able to be up on the wall, up on the chart. Uh, one is a map so we can easily see the different locations and the competitive relationships and so forth. Uh, and two is a summary chart that has each of the five categories and the way each of the three applicants was rated. So we'll just have a summary uh, rating sheet that we can look at. Is there anything else that we would want from staff or consultants for tools to do this process? Well, by, a, by a summary rating, you mean the overall rating in each category? Or yeah, the, yeah the, the overall rating in each category. We don't have it on one, we, we don't have it on one page, so you can just see it all. So we'd have, we'd have finance, mitigation, economic development, et cetera, across the three applicants. So the, the conversation we'll need to have that I think is very important is the weighting conversation, right? How do we value uh, each of these different um, uh, categories? Because looking at the score does not give us um, the information we need, in my mind anyway, to make that decision. Um, of like mind. Right. So that's, so you're, but that's what we're doing tomorrow is, is waiting. Yeah, I, I just, I guess I'm just, just looking at the scores, I, I think it could lead someone to look oh, and I say, whoa, saying. that's, and that's actually not what we'll be doing tomorrow. Just because somebody has more green doesn't necessarily mean they Correct. Wait, they we wait. haven't had that's a waiting right. discussion. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, yeah, if, if you don't want to put that up because of that, reason that it might be misleading. I mean, I think we can, we should make it clear to everybody, <coughs> excuse me, That's if we question. haven't before, that um, it, these are unweighted. All of these 200 questions, all of the consolidated criteria, summary questions, all the roll-ups to the evaluation category answer, uh, rate, ratings are all ratings without assigning value. So theoretically, you could have be the green in one and low in an, all four, and if we thought the one was most important, you could still win. So, so that should be clear to everybody. And if, if you're concerned that having the chart, I mean, might be misleading. I, I think it may be. Okay. And I, I share that concern. Okay. Fair enough. So, Melissa, if you can scratch that idea. <laughs> you could sneak it to me on the side. Um, anything else that we would want? Anything else in terms of heads up to the audience. The process, as, as I'm seeing it, but let's just talk this through. First thing in the morning at 9.30, um, each commissioner, let's say in the same order that we went in our presentations, will respond to the questions of fact that have been raised, uh, if any. And while you're up there, any other outstanding questions that were raised during your evaluation conversations. So we'll start with Commissioner McHugh and then Commissioner Zuniga and so forth. And you will have talked, we will have talked to staff about anything that came in from the applicants about questions uh, of fact. Once that's done, we're ready to start deliberating. And um, I thought I would ask everybody 
for starters, as we, as we have done uh, in the adjudicatory hearings, sort of where you stand, where you think, where do you think we are, um, what do you think the critical variables are, what are the critical issues, and get that from everybody, and then we go to work. Sounds like a good plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do we have anything else before temporary adjournment? All right. I guess we will adjourn temporarily. We will reconvene at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you all very much.